Hello, hello. Yes, there is sound. That is a good start. Uh, I'm Johan, as uh, presented. Uh, I wrote a book about Git, and I say accidentally because it was mostly because I wanted to see if I could. Uh, and uh, I succeeded, but I find Git quite boring these days, because why should we care about Git? It's working on completely the wrong abstraction level of uh, us trying to solve our day-to-day -day tasks. Um, but uh, if you want to nerd snipe me later, I'm happy to take either side of the discussion in uh, classics such as uh, pull requests are bad, uh, mono repositories or many repositories, or like uh, we can uh, trunk based development, merge or pull uh, or rebases. I'll uh, take any side and uh, do my best to be right anyway. Um, I'm currently a software engineer for at Uber, uh, working in Aarhus, and uh, most days at least they're like Uber is not in Denmark, uh, but uh, Uber is uh, building software in in Denmark. Um, hashtag we're hiring, and now I won't mention any more about that. Um, before uh, yes, so. It's the last talk of the day. We are all tired. I hope you've had some good talks, uh, seen some good talks. I have. Uh, we'll, let's do it a, a little bit light. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, we can't focus. Before I started uh, actually building software, like on my own, not on my own with my colleagues, but actually being a software engineer, I was a DevOps consultant or uh, buzzword compliant, I suppose. Uh, mostly spending my time uh, with organizations, trying to figure out how to make them better at building software or maintaining software, running software. I just say we build software and then it's implied that we also test our software, we run our software, we monitor our software, like all those kind of things that are basic hygiene that maybe we as an industry forget is the basics that we must do. Um, and based on that, I will talk a bit about how automation is hard and we're doing it wrong. Um, yes, so that's kind of the context. DevOps is this still a buzzword thing? I Even though that SRE, everyone wanted an SRE team two years ago, three years ago. Now everyone is starting up a platform engineering organization or something like that. Um, but I think we can conclude that everyone still wants to be, be agile and do DevOps, right? Um, so uh, I guess that's my, my reason that I think DevOps is still relevant. DevOps has one of these uh, unfortunate things where, depending on who you ask, DevOps is something different. Like, there's eight different definitions, and generally the definition depends on what people are trying to sell you. But one of the commonly accepted definitions is, is COMS, which is uh, DevOps is about culture. It's about psychological safety, creating a culture where we learn, do continuous stuff. It's also about automation, uh, minimize toil, minimize manual work, all these software engineering things that we want to do. It's about lean, um, removing waste, looking at our value streams, um, that kind of thing. It's about measuring. Some, th some people say we want to be uh, committed to the truth, and I think more like we want to actually focus on reality rather than opinion. Truth sounds like very capital T. And then it's about sharing. Making global, making local wins global. Um, not like necessarily, and we will push our uh, code or our stuff into the public domain, but the wins that we have at the team level, we will uh, make sure that we uh, disseminate them throughout our organizations, uh, making a larger impact. But when we know we want this DevOps thing, and we don't really know how it, it, we're doing it. But we did an agile transformation, and that was complete. So now we'll do a DevOps transformation, I suppose. But how do we start? And then we look at it. Culture, that's kind of difficult and vague, and how do we even approach this? Measuring sounds like something that will keep me accountable. That's scary. Lean is boring. 
we're not a production company, and sharing sounds like uh, some hippie bullshit. So uh, we'll start with automation, obviously, right? And that just leads us to the notion that we need an army of robots, right? What is automation? That's tons of robots that does stuff for us. But when we want to achieve DevOps heaven, DevOps nirvana, and we are taking automation as the very first step, it becomes very important for our DevOps transformation how we go about this, because it will set the entire context for our narrative around our DevOps transformation. And the problem is our organizations are wrong about automation. So one of the core chronically conflicts about DevOps in a traditional organization is that we think we can either optimize for speed or we can optimize for stability. But kind of the DevOps promise is that if we become very quick, we will also become very stable. If we are very stable, that's a prerequisite for being very quick. And that's kind of the DevOps promise, contrary to intuition. And, and our organization thinks about automation as a luxury, right? The, the engineers, they can automate when they have done their feature work, right? Um, but that's just plain wrong. Uh, we're co generally constrained as software engineers, not by... Uh, we could be constrained by ideas, we could be constrained by resources, but that's the wrong way of looking at it. I've never seen a team run out of things to do. Right? Our backlogs, they grow in one direction, and it's not downwards. And simultaneously, what is it, why are we so afraid of running out of stuff to do? Oh no! Three software engineers with nothing to do, they will probably break something. No, they will build something genius. They will solve all the problems, because now they have time, now they have slack. Um, so there's uh, this general uh, concept. I, I talked to uh, a software engineer, and he was like, I always make sure that I allocate myself around 130%, because then I know I will always have something to do. Okay. So at what utilization do you run your service? <laughs> and I know big cloud providers over subscription, probably smart stuff you can do. Unlikely it's a good idea for most people. So we are constrained not by the uh, things that we can do, we are constrained about what the things that we choose to do. And uh, this is a graph from uh, Accelerate, a book. Uh, there was just recent, how many are familiar with uh, Accelerate, the book? about uh, a number uh, of people, um, ballpark figure. Uh, one of the great things about this uh, book, Accelerate, the science of uh, high-performing technology organizations or something like that, uh, is that you can read it as an engineer and it will give you all the arguments for talking to your manager about doing the things that you know as a subject matter expert that you should be doing. And you can say, well, this is a science that shows that if we don't do things the good way, it is a bad business decision. A and that might be a superpower for engineers who kind of like don't want to talk about money and things like that. But uh, anyway, this is a figure from a uh, set book where uh, generally they have done some survey and figured out what uh, are the prime uh, things that organizations that are successfully doing uh, DevOps, they're calling it. One of the things that they do, and uh, they show two things, uh, that being good at delivering software, at doing DevOps, is good for the business, and that it actually uh, are some concrete things that you can do. And this actually shows that the high-performing uh, organizations, they succeed in increasing the amount of deploys per developer per day as they grow. Right, that's the scale golden goal, right? Because we know in many organizations, as they grow, they become, there's more coordination, there's more uh, organization, there's more process, there's more bureaucracy, right? Because we are more people. But the very excellent organizations actually succeed in making that, leverage that and become more effective rather than less effective per person. 
And that means stuff like manual tests, manual deploys, all these things, they have consequences. Right? We're coding on the margins. We want to minimize the cost of adding one more engineer while maximizing the value of adding one more engineer, right? And how do we do that? We automate. So automation is not a luxury, it's permission to play. I don't want to buy software from people who do not think about automation. I don't want to buy software from people who are not automating their unit tests. Right? Because I don't want to buy software from people who are basically wasting their time. Right? They're not wasting their time doing unit testing or things like that. They're actually making better value for me as a customer because they're doing stuff better. If you look at from the same report at some of the things that we automate across uh, different performance profiles, uh, these data are, are getting kind of ancient uh, or in our world two years old. Um, but one of the interesting things is that we can see in the top two lines we have things like automated build and automated unit tests. And across the board, more than half of all organizations are automating these things. So if you are in an organization where you do not have automated builds and automated unit tests, that should really be an indication that you should self-reflect a bit. Um, we also have all sorts of crazy stuff like uh, integration with Slack and automated deployment to production is at least in the hype of an elite performing uh, organizations, again, more than half. Um, and it's not like this is a check mark and you should do uh, all these things and then you will be better, but it's just interesting to see what are the things that we can automate and, and how do we actually do it. Um, some of the things are a bit weird to me, like uh, we have over here in our corner, that 4% of the elite performers, those are the most excellent companies at delivering software, they don't uh, automate anything. I, <laughs> I, I'm unsure what's going on here. <laughs> But I guess there, there needs to be some counterexample. So, um, and, and it's already here. We have the technology. Come again? No? Yes. Um, this is, again, an ancient screenshot, more than two years old. And uh, this is a public uh, open source repository where a robot notices there's a dependency that needs to be updated, so it creates a pull request. Another robot runs and builds the code, verifies that the change is valid, and uh, then the code is automated, uh, automatically merged to the, the repository, after which uh, another robot replies with a thumbs up GIF. Right? This is an, uh, in an open source project. In the Agile uh, manifest, we have something along the lines of building software teams around motivated individuals. Right? That, this is motivated individuals. <laughs> now imagine we have motivated individuals with a budget. Right? That should be all of us in our day job, right? Otherwise, something is wrong. So if this is possible for motivated individuals without a budget, the world's our oyster. Everything is possible. And one of the most common uh, excuses are, but the customer doesn't want automation. Right? Customer doesn't want to pay for automation. Okay. I'm pretty sure your customer also doesn't want to pay for uh, your daily stand-up or your retrospective. Or you're, if you're so lucky, you're in a safe universe, you're PI planning. Mmm, that's my favorite part of the invoice. It doesn't matter. Somehow you convinced me that you actually know about building software. So you know what should be part of building software. The line item. We build software. One unit. Many millions. Right? So, so why is it that suddenly we accidentally lead the abstraction that the customer gets to decide whether we unit test our code or not? It's completely crazy. And, and the same is related to the, like, the customer doesn't want my release. How many here have struggled with getting a customer to actually install something new? 
that you released to them, okay? A, a few. The rest of you are extremely lucky. I don't know how that happened. But this is not, not uncommon. A customer goes to you, say, I would like to give you money to build this. And then say, yes, I will build this. Then you come back soon thereafter, motivated, happy. Here, I built what you paid me to do. And they say, no, I, we don't want it now. It's completely crazy. So there's something odd on the friction of the perceived friction versus the perceived value of whatever you're trying to hand to your customers. And this is also where automation comes into place. Uh, and, and generally, why is it a choice? I think there's this famous uh, Apple thing where they bundled together a new release of a new set of emojis on uh, macOS such that people would get the security update. <laughs> how silly is that? <laughs> so either the user doesn't understand how the importance of the security update, that it is valuable to them, or the friction in getting that security update. <laughs> no, not now. Delay one month, yes. Right. Th it, there's something out there. There's an excellent uh, research professor called Jan Bosch, who uh, does some good writing and, and some research. Um, and he has done uh, some things around why digitalization will kill your company too. And uh, he names uh, six reasons, and I hope it's six, otherwise the slide will prove me wrong. Limited software skills in their senior leadership. So it's a new world. Uh, if we're trying to manage building software as we are trying to manage building uh, physical hardware, it's going to be uh, a challenge. We're going to fail or at least have tons of unnecessary friction. Another challenge is ambidexterity. So that is uh, basically being able to both look at the long term and the short term at the same time. Uh, most often, at least my bias towards or against uh, traditional companies, quote, is that we tend to dive down into the day-to-day -day and we want to focus on the next feature. And then someone will say, well, after the next sprint, then you can do the improvements, then you can fix the technical debt. But it will always be after the next sprint, right? And I, I know uh, Christian is a big proponent of uh, Improvement Mondays. And it's important that it's uh, Monday that's an Improvement Day because otherwise it's not more important than actually doing the work the rest of the week. And also, if you've decided you want to spend one day a week at improving, why are you doing it at the end? You could have had four days where you were better. That's one of the craziest things about SAFE, where you have an improvement sprint at the end. Start with the improvement sprint. Um, leaders will also believe that digitalization is a, an R&D uh, research and development problem, right? Rather than saying, research, uh, no, digitalization, technology, software, it's a business problem. Uh, and that leads to both conflicts and, and lack of focus. There's only four bullet points. I was like, way off. Uh, and justify the lack of initiative, referring to the lack of desire for change from their most valuable customers. Right? And, and that just goes again to what is it that we believe in? What is it that we should be able to motivate ourselves to do? What is it that we take responsibility for as professionals? Um, and then there's this notion that automation is complex. And that's wrong. Asterix. If we're taking a shovel and we want to move a ton of dirt, uh, an upgrade to an uh, excavator is an obvious upgrade and we can have automated some of the process. But sometimes what we try to do as developers is that we have this game of Jenga and we want to deploy it throughout this rickety bridge, except that it's not just a game of Jenga and someone is playing with it while we move it. Right? That's kind of like the tasks that we're trying to do and then it becomes less obvious what we're trying to solve, what we're trying to automate. And um, there's this uh, quote from uh, Nicole Forsgren, who is uh, one of the, the, who's the primary author of the Accelerate that I mentioned earlier, saying that they, their findings show that industry and technology stack doesn't matter, architecture does. 
So it doesn't matter what we're trying to do, it matters how we're trying to do it. Uh, and I think there's uh, another caveat that I would call the, the last cruise uh, corollary, right word? Good. Uh, which is uh, you ha also have a ton of choice in your technology stack. Right? If you choose to be on a mainframe, or if you choose to be on-prem rather than in cloud, that also imposes some perhaps unnecessary restrictions on your, uh, on your um, architecture. But basically, um, we don't have software architecture based on blueprints, right? We don't build something and then it stays there forever. Except it kind of feels that way, right? When we have written the code, it's permanent. When we have named the piece of code, it will be the same name forever, right? We think, ah, it's not important, we'll just, uh, we'll just do it. Then uh, we'll fix it when we get there. And uh, eight years later, it's become a two-year plan to migrate, right? For each desired change, make the change easy. Warning, this may be hard, then make the easy change, right? We want to keep the focus on actually making changes easy to do. That should be one of the prime characteristics of software architecture. One of the prime quality dimensions of software is how easy is it to change. Right? Then we can also talk about the artifact that our software... Actually, I'll make a distinction. There's a distinction between our code and our software. Right? Our software needs to be performant. It needs to be deployable needs to be measurable, observability -able. Our code needs to be easy to change. We also need to think testability into our code, right? A and this is again one place where people are struggling to test things because their thing that they're testing is trying to be hard. Uh, it's not trying to be hard. I know some people are trying to make their software hard. How many are familiar with the KISS principle? Keep it simple, stupid. How many are familiar with the kick me principle? None? Keep it complex, keep me employed. <laughs> I know we have all met one. <laughs> I digress. Like when we're trying, when we're building our software, if, it, if we're not thinking things like testability, deployability, all the abilities into the code, and we're just trying to sprinkle them on afterwards. Of course we will struggle, of course there will be tons of friction. Deployability. Um, so, like, my way of thinking about this is that automating th simple things is simple, but automating complex things might be impossible while retaining sanity. Right? Um, and that's kind of where the automation becomes complex. It becomes complex when we're trying to do complex things with our automation, rather than in itself. And that was the kind thing. That was saying, well, the organization, our managers, our leaders, they're wrong about automation. But the problem is, we, the engineers, we are also wrong about automation. Automation is software, so we should treat it as such. But we know I have a script for that, right? It seems like every time we smell the opportunity, even though we know about dry and solid, whether you like it or not, principles, like we have all these tools in our t box of architectural things and microservices, and then we smell the opportunity to write a simple bash script and we throw away all the principles that we know about. How do we share our code? Well, I could email you my script or attach it to a Slack message. Why is it not in Git? Well, it's just something I wrote. Okay, but we agree that it interacts with production systems and should be a part of eight different runbooks. Yeah, yeah, but... So version control matters. Version control our automation. Uh, if it's not version controlled, it doesn't exist. Testing still matters. But it's hard to test automation, yes? but we also paid very well. So maybe it's expected that we do hard things. Uh, things like approval testing might be useful for, for us scripting, uh, testing scripts and automation. Documentation still matters, even though it's extremely annoying. I can also take both sides on the argument on whether code should be self-documenting or not. 
uh, write documentation, make good documentation. I'm so sad I missed the talk earlier today on, on, on engineering documentation. Um, documentation matters both for ourselves, for our colleagues, for our users, for everyone. Um, and then we have this tendency to automate all the things, right? It's either or. Either we do it manually or we go completely overboard in the other direction and automate all the things. But we never stop up to remember what is the total cost of ownership of our tools that we build, right? We kind of uh, become the accidental ops of some piece of critical infrastructure because it uh, solved a small problem once and then we forgot to actually make it into a real project. Um, and uh, we have the not invented here syndrome. It's much easier to build something that matches your own mental model rather than getting something that has a ton, tons of good practices in it. But we maybe have to tweak our own mental model a bit in order to fit in it. I have this theory that uh, any organization over a certain number of employees, I'm not sure what the number is, but they will have built their own version of a message bus, right? It's just a message bus. How hard can it be? But there are very, very large open source projects that are trying to solve these problems. And but it's just easier when you're all you see is that, well, we just need to publish some messages and consume them. How hard can it be? And there's also it's actually called also called the IKEA effect. We love stuff more that we build ourselves. Um so um build versus buy, I guess. Um, but, but we love building stuff and we forget that uh, there are tons of things that we didn't account for. So just a few useful practices for our automation. Uh, we want the fundamentals to be in place. So uh, automation is running. It is a piece of living software. Uh, it is not just some bash scripts on my laptop. It is version controlled. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. It is documented. And of course, also tested. So at least in my opinion, uh, I'm not saying that doing things in bash is bad, but I'm saying that even though we have the intuition that it is just a couple of scripts, we still need to apply the same software engineering principles to everything we build. <coughs> then we also want to monitor progress. Uh, so is our automation doing the thing that we're expecting at the rate we are expecting? Uh, is things actually happening or not? We want to have circuit breakers such that if uh, someone does something silly or unintended, uh, we might not just continue scaling up infinitely. Um, so uh, we want to have something saying, well, if our automation wants to do this, that will be very expensive or very risky. Maybe we want someone to verify we want to do this. And of course, we want to alert on an active circuit breaker uh, saying, uh, well, now our automation is no, no longer progressing because we are in some sort of uh, error state. And the inverse is uh, also ni nice. We want to have an alert on a stale circuit breaker override. So let's say that I'm doing something new and our automation wants to, I've just onboarded a new use case. So our automation is starting and wants to scale stuff up. I might be very okay with that going very quickly, so I'll bump the circuit breaker limit. But a week later, when we are back to normal operations, and we would like to assume normal operations, and forgetting something like a, a circuit breaker limit override in a configuration is a classic way to destroy stuff. So uh, with great power comes great option for shooting in foot. Right, it's we can build extremely powerful tools. With extremely powerful tools, we can do extremely powerful things. Uh, another thing is that we want to be uh, item potent. <coughs> And that basically means that we want to have no additional effects by doing the same thing over and over. So uh, there's a difference between saying there should be three servers and removing a server and saying remove a server. 
So because in the normal situation, this might be the same. But if we have some robot that uh, is uh, running amok, uh, one of the situations might end up in a very poopy situation. In the same argument, we don't want to act on a lack of data. So there's a very big difference semantically between there should be zero servers and removing them versus I don't know if there should be any servers, so I will remove them, right? Uh, one of these options is much more robust than the other. Mm, excellent. <laughs> and so our organizations are wrong about automation. We, the software engineers, are wrong about automation. And we approach automation initiatives wrong. Great stuff. We have a very uh, crappy strategy about doing automation initiatives. Our strategy tends to be we want to automate something that makes stuff cheaper to do, so we profit. Done and done. That also means that our automation initiatives are often dr driven by cost down, right? We have a logic saying, well, if we spend X hours uh, doing this each week and we can cut some amount of those hours away, we uh, you have less cost um, attributed to this. But I think that's a bit of an unnuanced approach to automation initiatives and actually missing out on the cool stuff. Um, there's this thing called Jevon's Paradox, which says when we increase efficiency, it doesn't necessarily mean that we reduce consumption. Uh, it was a British economist, I think, who noticed that there was a theory that as we are consuming energy, very timely these days, uh, as our, for instance, coal engines get more uh, efficient at turning coal into energy, um, we will have an overall uh, lower consumption of coal, which is great. Turns out, as efficiency uh, increased, tons of use cases opened up and consumptions increased uh, globe o overall, which is counterintuitive. But the interesting thing about this is also if we only have the cost down uh, part of our automation initiatives uh, taking into account, we will miss things about saying, well, there's a huge difference in how we can iterate if it takes a full day of manual work that are likely to be a bit iffy if it succeeds or not to deploy a new system versus if it's a click on a button and half an hour of wait time. That will completely change the way we work. But whether it will get funded, if we only are considering the half day a week that we will save in engineering hours, it's difficult to say. And there's also this, uh, this is also from uh, the Accelerate book, where as we go from uh, the right to the left, uh, we have uh, the performance category of the organizations and they tend to do stuff like we start looking at deployment automation and uh, that will reduce some uh, manual work but it will also actually increase the amount of manual work done by different organizations or by different people and that means that until we're actually focusing on the entire uh, automating the entire delivery chain we might actually end up in a situation where we start an automation initiative, we remove some type of manual work, which turns out was a bottleneck that prevented us from creating a ton more of different work. So we end up in a situation where we're saying we're maintaining complex automation and we're doing more manual work than we were before. So automation sucks. Automation is not for us, right? But what we uh, must take into account is whether the we have changed the type of manual work that we're doing, right? Have we removed all the waste that we did setting things up? So now we actually have a different bottleneck resource. 
So if we are not aware of this S curve, then we might actually get to the most possible, painful possible position and just think, ah, shucks. This was bad. So, so it takes getting to the end to reap the entire benefit, and we need to be aware of the different dimensions that we're working along. Um, and, and there is no silver bullet, right? Even though we want to automate everything, and uh, of course the boring consultant's answer is it always depends. The new version of there is no silver bullet is there might be a silver bullet, but I doubt that all your problems are werewolf-shaped. Um, so when we're looking into automation, uh, there's nothing so use useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. Um, and I think we uh, we can attest to that. And uh, as software engineers in reasonably sized organizations, uh, there are so many useless things being done. Uh, but like we need to challenge what are the useful and the useless activities that we're doing. Uh, and the best part of automation is to not do something. So uh, the key takeaways that I'd like to provide you with is that uh, automation is software, so we should treat it as software. Automation is way more than cost down. Automatability, which I'm unsure if it's an, is an actual word, but it needs to be a first-class citizen of our development process. It needs to be something that we take into account when we do our architecture, when we do our work. Um, yes, there's a bunch of sources. There's also a uh, uh, 2020 and 2021 uh, version of these reports. I didn't get to read the 2022 yet, but uh, generally they are, are good sources of information. And uh, I think uh, that was it.